You're listening to Eye on the Community. I'm Vicki Pepper. The Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization is a comprehensive, ongoing project to build an unprecedented collection of Jewish writings, political thought, religion, visual and performing arts, music, and cultural contributions from around the globe. Unlike an encyclopedia, the Posen Library puts readers directly in touch with original works, unmediated by interpretation. On the line with me is Deborah Dashmore, editor-in-chief of the Posen Library. She's also professor of history and Professor of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Professor Moore, start by telling us about the Posen Library. Where is it in the publication process and why is it unique? It's at the midpoint in the publication process. It's a 10-volume library. That's what the word library refers to, these 10 volumes that are collected. And five of them will be uh, published as of the end of March, uh, which means we're halfway there. But why is it unique is a bigger question. It's unique because nothing like this has ever been tried before in English. It involves translation from dozens of languages in which Jews wrote and bringing them into the English language so that English readers can get a taste of this incredible diversity of Jewish culture and civilization. It's also unique because of the, its conceptualization of Jewish culture and civilization. So it's not just about, what should we say, the biggest hits, the greatest hits. It's not just about what famous rabbis wrote. It's also about what women wrote, It's about certain hidden gems um, that our volume editors have found and brought to light. It it gives one a very broad sense of how incredibly diverse and rich Jewish culture and civilization is. And it spans from the biblical period all the way up to the 21st century. How many contributors were involved with this? Oh, gosh. Um, (laughs) Well... uh, Each volume is organized separately. So the volumes have time periods that they cover. And usually there's one or two editors for a specific volume. The most recent volume had two editors. It was volume nine in terms of most recently published. And it covered the years from 1939 to 1973, called the years, as they call it, of catastrophe and rebirth. In addition... Each volume has an advisory board, and that usually includes maybe another dozen scholars whose expertise complement those of the two editors. Um, And then there are specialists who are approached. Um, There are people who know, for example, work in Hungarian. Not everybody does. And so we tap specialists in um, specific areas that reflect um, a a more unique part of of Jewish culture and civilization. I don't think I could give you a total, but I am sure it runs into the hundreds. Let me ask you another impossible question then. How many hours of research (laughs) would you say went into this? Oh, God. Thousands. Tens of thousands, actually. I I mean, I'm not just the the, uh, editor-in-chief. I was the co-editor of Volume 10, which covers the year 1973 to 2005. And I know what I put into it. And I was a co-editor, right? So I had a a partner in it. I spent several years and I read tons and tons of books and poetry and, you know, essays. And I just, yeah, it, it was an enormous enormous uh, amount of work. I I, I must admit, I don't think any of the editors who signed on to this uh, actually really knew quite what they they were getting in for. The idea of it was fantastic, but when you translate it into all of the work, it's uh, very challenging. I'm speaking with Deborah Dashmore, editor-in-chief of the Posen Library. If you had to choose one aspect of all of this research, what would you say you are most excited about? Well, I'll tell you, I'm most excited, I think, about what happens when you 
see the selections from these different sources next to each other in the page. I, I recently wrote about the year 1963 and how in, in one cluster you get an excerpt from Hannah Arendt, who is a political philosopher, German-Jewish, escapes the Nazis, about the Eichmann trial. And then right next to that, you have Betty Friedan's uh, The Feminine Mystique, an excerpt from that. And so we, I think in America, most people know who Betty Friedan was, right? Born in, in, in the U.S. and educated here. And then the third piece is by also another German Jew, a, a rabbi, uh, Joachim Prince, and it's the entire speech that he gives before Martin Luther King Jr. speaks in 1963 at the March for Jobs and Freedom on Washington. It's, you know, what becomes known as King's I Have a Dream speech. So here you see all part of Jewish culture and civilization, reflections on Holocaust, the important transformative book about feminism that changes the United States, and a key reflection on what Prince took away from his experience in Nazi Germany, which was that the biggest crime was the crime of silence, and that he said America should not become a, a nation of onlookers. That's, to my mind, what's fantastic about this uh, library, the Posen Library. It's just, you know, you gain insight by seeing these things next to each other on the page. Professor Moore, Holocaust Remembrance Day is this Wednesday, January 27th. We are now 75 years removed from the Holocaust. Why is it necessary for us to have a Holocaust Remembrance Day? Well, I think actually the further we go from the Holocaust, the more indeed we need to remember it because there are fewer and fewer people who actually lived through it. In the early years, everybody knew about it because it was part of their daily lives, right? They, they understood what had happened, and they were dealing with the aftermath, which is a, a very profound aftermath. But now we are coming close to the point where there are not very many survivors alive, and so it's really crucial to remember what happened because of the way it changed the world we live in today. I frequently see people, particularly on social media, accuse people with differing political views as them of being Nazis or acting like Nazis. And I see both conservatives and liberals doing this, so I don't want anyone to think I'm picking on any one side. But what is the effect of accusations like this? Well, unfortunately, those kinds of accusations are meant to generate a response and they don't rest upon real knowledge of what being a Nazi is, or was, I should say. And you see a lot of, of use of, of Holocaust imagery and stuff, which exploits the fact that it's, uh, I'll put quotation marks around this, quote, famous, right? So you're going to take a famous event, and you're going to use it for its shock value and to also strengthen the argument that you want to make. It's not really useful. It doesn't lead to conversation or any kind of reasoned dialogue. It's polemical. And whoever uses it, I think, is making a mistake. <laughs> I've been speaking with Deborah Dashmore, editor-in-chief of the Posen Library. Professor Moore, how can people get more information about this new library? Well, I'll tell you, the easiest way is to go to posenlibrary.com, one word, Posen Library, register for free, and you have access to all of these incredible sources. The volumes are also available for sale, but they are not cheap. <laughs> You can get them at Yale Books. You can get them at various other places that sell books. But if you want just to get a sense of how fascinating it is and how rich, then I would say go to postandlibrary.com and register and explore. Any last thoughts? I would urge your listeners to Take advantage of this incredible free resource as a way to deepen their own understanding of the past and also the pleasure 
that comes from reading things that are new and looking at their gorgeous visual material, reproductions of, of paintings, there's uh, photographs, uh, there's architecture, all kinds of, of wonderful visual dimensions that people would just enjoy. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.